On the 26th of November 2019, a young man named Chen Zeliang of Guangdong, who was 27 at the time, received a final judgment from an intermediate court. It was some sort of victory for him, though he was not being acquitted. His sentence was reduced from 15 months to 12, a relatively rare occasion for a criminal case in mainland China to be partly overturned by an upper court following an appeal. He was prosecuted, convicted, and sentenced to fixed term imprisonment on the accusation of committing the crime of picking quarrels and provoking trouble. Xun Xin Zi Shi, on the grounds of his essays posted on WeChat, a social media platform in mainland China, questioning the local water company's compulsory collection of the 400 yuan tap water pipe renovation fee. These assets supposed to were deemed by the prosecution as releasing false information, stirring up trouble, and causing a serious public disorder. Chen was fortunate, actually, and yet such good luck hadn't fallen upon many appellants like him. Xiang Xianling of Hubei, for instance, was one example of the many unlucky ones. A farmer with the highest education background of a primary school, Xiang was caught at the age of 41 and was convicted of picking quarrels and provoking trouble for petitioning many times for the local police's improper handling of her son's unexplained death in school and her husband's suicide shortly after. She claimed that she and her late husband were brutally treated by the local police and posted related materials on the internet. The appeal did not bring her any change in the final judgment. The first instant court ruling was upheld, and she had to serve three whole years in prison. Nor was that kind of sheer luck fallen upon Xiao Mingjiao of Hunan, who was 52 at capture, had had a small shop but wasn't doing anything at the time because of her poor health, appealed but failed to overturn the verdict of the 30 months long sentence for, according to the judgment, not content with compensation for her demolished shop, claiming that the chauffeur of the local PCC owed her over 80,000 yuan unsettled and petitioned many times in Beijing. She was captured, granted bail for her poor health condition, and recaptured, re-granted bail, and then recaptured again for the third time in a row. A similar fate was upon Nianlina of Henan, a little bit harsher. She was not content with the compensation and resettlement solution for her mother's demolished house. She then recorded a video titled Lunar New Year on Debris, and she uploaded it to the internet. And for that very reason, she was sentenced to 36 months in prison. She appealed, but of course, failed. And there was Li Longquan of Guizhou, 54, unemployed, with the highest education he received was primary school. He petitioned in Guiyang, the capital of Guizhou, for his barely compensated encroached land and his past experience of being tortured by the local police. He uploaded pictures of his petition to the internet, and as a result, he received 16 months of imprisonment. Appeal dismissed. These are just a few cases, very few actually, that once could be retrieved from the official judgment archive of site China Judgment Online, Taipan Wen Shuwa. These defendants, often in their 40s or even 50s, with low education levels, without good incomes or careers, went on petitioning due to their lost land, boat, child or loved ones. How provocative can that be? And by writing some essays or posting a video on the internet, these unfortunate people want to get themselves heard. What damage can it make? If it wasn't out of the utmost despair, why would Xiao Mingjiao, who had been granted the bill three times in a row due to her poor health, fight so hard for her demolished shop? And notably, most of these defendants choose to appeal even though they knew perfectly well that there was almost no chance of an overturn. It is shocking to realize that a large portion of these speech crime cases was not from those well-educated, politically dissentious intellectuals, but from those humble, little-educated bottom class, whose voices were often unheard. And when they cannot put up with it anymore, most of them still have faith in the system and choose to believe the CCP 
and they will then go petitioning Shang Fang. In theory, everyone can file their petition with the National Public Complaints and Proposals Administration, Guojia Xinfang Ju. You can just visit this place in person and register your identity and file complaints on site. But local authorities also have the power to prevent you from doing so. They can send agents to Beijing to block you on your way, or if you are so stubbornly determined, and if indeed you have petitioned in Beijing several times, you might be arrested and put on trial, like these cases mentioned earlier. The petitioners put their trust and faith in the system, and yet the system put them into prison. But the regime did not stop there. Entering the autumn of 2019, the criminalization of political opinion expressions began to generalize. Instead of only incarcerating those established dissidents and those petitioners, the regime has chosen to move one step forward and to be really down to earth on this. Hence, the grassroots dissidents, whom as unknown as myself, are becoming their new targets. In May 2022, the mainstream media in mainland China reported a man with the surname of Ma being arrested. Under the suspicions of inciting splitting the state and inciting some version of state power, which led to a great plunge in Alibaba's shares, with the speculation widespread of the suspect captured was indeed Jack Ma himself. Only to be clarified later that the suspect was not him, and therefore their shares went up again. Some coverage of this absurd drama can still be found today. Like this one shown on the screen here by Bloomberg, but the fact is, the suspect who received such great fanfare was actually nobody. A Twitter user with the ID of Yaya 2022-10, registered in 2021, tweeted 15 tweets and received only about 120 followers before his account was found out. His delusional fantasies, if I may put it like this. Would not even be worth a snort in most countries, or even in mainland China, if it was even five years ago. But now, an unknown nobody like him should be charged with two state security crimes, each with life imprisonment as the heaviest punishment possible. Let's pause here for a moment, for that I'd like to explain the sources of the cases. Most of the cases cited here in this video were once published by China Judgment Online, the Taipan Wenshu Wang, official archive website for judgments drawn by the Supreme People's Court of China. But all these judgments were no longer available on that website anymore. From the very beginning, judgments of sensitive cases like those of inciting subversion, Shandong Dianfu Guojia Zhengquan, or any other state security endangering cases. Wei Hai Guo Jia An Quan Zui were not published. Cases of disturbing the work order of state organs, Zhao Luan Guo Jia Ji Guan Gong Zuo Zhi Xu, or disturbing the public order in a gang, Ju Dong Zhao Luan Se Hui Zhi Xu, often falls on those who assembled to petition, were also very likely not to be published in the first place. Only those judgments of some of the cases that falls under picking quarrels and provoking trouble, Xun Xin Zhi Shi, libel. Feibang or defamation, Wuzhu, were published on that website for the time, and when it came to some time in the middle of 2020, the website began to hide those judgments of picking quarrels and provoking trouble if the cases were related to political reasons. These hidden judgments cannot be searched by its own search engine on the website, but they can be navigated to if filters were carefully chosen on the left pane of the site. And if you have the time to browse all the cases listed on the right, you might find some citations lying there. But for these hidden cases, the only thing you could get was a record of the citation and the defendant's name. No content of the judgment will be shown if clicked. Only a line that reads "reason for non-disclosure." Other reasons that the People's Court held not appropriate to make it public on the internet. 人民法院认为不宜在网际网络上公布的其他情形。My case is one of them, and I have fortunately captured a screenshot of that page of the should-be judgment of mine. And by saying fortunate, that means even pages like this are not accessible now. 
At the beginning of June 2021, they took another step to completely erase all the judgment of political cases. Not even the citations can now be found on that website. In fact, they removed these records in such a hurry that they even did not have the time to identify which judgment of the cases of picking quarrels and provoking trouble were political ones and which were not. They just removed nearly all of them, with only not even five cases left under this category, which I reckon that it must be some database errors that prevented the deletion of these cases. Web pages of China Judgment Online cannot be archived using the Internet Archive due to its login wall. It requires a mobile number to register an account, and all activities on the website require signed-in status to continue. Fortunately, a Twitter account with the ID of Speech Freedom CN has been collecting these judgments of speech crime cases since the 14th of October 2019, and there are now over 600 judgments saved by them, dated as early as 2007. I cannot thank them enough for all the hard work and might also be a dangerous one that they have done in the past three years. Without them, this video will have nowhere to begin. Unfortunately, judgments of the cases that reached the court ruling after the 2020 will most likely not be seen, although the dissidents or their defenders who received such judgments might choose to publish them on the internet in person, most of them were threatened not to do so. Some of the judgments cited here in the video were acquired directly from these activities or dissidents. Therefore, I cannot share the details, but only to include them in general descriptions or analysis. Otherwise, it will bring serious trouble to those involved, since they are still stranded in mainland China and are closely watched by the regime. How serious this situation can be, here is an example. Back in a couple of months ago, a dissident with a name that I cannot disclose, of course, sent his judgment to speech freedom and CN and authorized the latter party to publish it. Speech frequency and then did so, they posted his judgment on Twitter, and within less than 10 hours since the tweet was posted, he, the dissident, was summoned by the local police office, questioning why his judgment was disclosed and published on the internet. The local police told him that they received an order from the Provincial Internet Monitoring Brigade, Shen Wang Jian Da Zui, to investigate this matter, and they were told that the disclosure of his judgment had caused no very bad impact. He was then reprimanded by the local police officers for several hours, and he was only allowed to go home until nearly midnight that day. So here I've chosen more than 90 cases that happened roughly in between 2019 and 2020, with 69 of them being purely political ones and the rest were cases of petitioners that I have already talked about earlier in this video. When I say purely political, I mean it. In the following 69 cases I would like to unfold, the defendants did not insult or abuse any particular private person, not even the CCP party secretary of the local government, since I do reckon that they, I mean the local government level party secretary, are very well deserved to be protected from being abused as everyone else. There were some cases of such collected by speech freedom of CN, but I did not choose them, nor did I choose those who were involved in abusing the police. There were a large number of cases of that sort. Speech freedom of CN might reckon that this sort of conduct falls in the realm of freedom of speech, but it is indeed punishable in many countries around the world, for example here in the UK. And cases of flag desecration were also excluded from the following discussion since these conducts were too regarded as criminal offenses in many places around the world. So the 469 cases I selected were purely political ones that mostly only concerned online political expressions. The first one I'd like to show you is Zhang Shuling of the Haicheng of Liaoning, born in 1998. He was identified as suffering from a mental disorder by the Forensics Institute of the Provincial Mental Health Center of Liaoning, and therefore he could only bear limited criminal liability. And it was carried out in this manner since he was accompanied to the court by his father as his agent. John was caught on the 5th of October 2019 for only one message he posted a day before in a cookie group, an online group chat platform run by Tencent, using his elder brother's QQ account. 
He was found guilty on the 22nd of December of 2020, which is 444 days later, on the grounds of the divine message mentioned before, which, according to the prosecution, insulted a prominent state leader. And for that reason, John was sentenced to 15 months of imprisonment. The prosecution did accuse him of posting more messages in the past that insulted that prominent state leader, but the only evidence they got was one message John posted on the 4th of October 2019. Similar situation can be found in the cases of Li Fei of Pingchang of Sichuan and of Zhou Shaoqing of Hedong of Tianjin. One was suffering from mild mental retardation and one was suffering from schizophrenia. Li was accused of had made improper remarks that insulted the leader of the party and the state and supported the independence of Hong Kong by posting on WeChat moments, writing down on papers and hanging them on the office building of the government of Yuan Xitang, or by sending SMS or written notes to others, which the prosecution had found that his conduct damaged the reputation of the party and the state, hurt the feeling of others. Zhou was accused of had posted or reposted 120 tweets of untrue remarks and images that disparaged the state leader and the political system of the state, defamed the nation policies in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic and causing others to repost and leave negative comments. They were sentenced to 10 and 9 months of imprisonment, respectively. The case of Xu Quan was a rather interesting one among all the cases I read. It was not as interesting the case itself, rather the judgment he received was quite rare. Xu was in his early 40s a veteran having served 12 years in Tibet. By the time he was caught, he was waiting for his placement. The prosecution accused him of having posted, reposted 221 tweets of fabricated false information in which 113 of them concerned major Hong Kong events. 54 of them attacked the CCP and the government, and another 54 of them attacked the state system and the democracy and the rule of law of our country. The prosecution was kind enough to point out that only 18 out of 221 in total were retreated with opinions of his own. He was then sentenced to nine months of imprisonment. But the interesting part is, the judgment of it ended very unexpectedly with a rather lengthy commentary just before the ruling, which is quite rarely seen in other cases in mainland China. It reads, Among the copious tweets of false information reported by the defendant, many of them, supported by screenshots as evidence, were viewed thousands or even tens of thousands of times and received many comments, retweets and likes. The public would be delighted to hear and see if those tweets were promoting the socialist positive energy. But how often would things not turn out as we wish, as the reposted tweets of the defendant were false information that assailed the state system and democracy and the rule of law? These tweets have misled the netizens, causing the broader impact on the online society and induced serious public disorder. The conduct of the defendant has also run counter to the socialist core values. The so-called democracy and freedom he campaigned for were just some empty slogans that simply cannot be achieved. It is rare because most of the judgments of political cases these days tend to keep them short. Very short, like this one I received. Yes, of course I blurred it, but you can still get the message, which is with such big margins and large font size, it finished itself in just two and a half pages. A criminal judgment, even in a place like mainland China, is required to lay out certain indispensable elements the motive of why the defendant committed the crime, the criminal facts that detailed how the defendant committed the crime, and the extent and content of the different legal interests as protected by the very article in the criminal law that the prosecution used to charge the defendant. Unfortunately, many of the selected cases lack all the three elements that mentioned, and you can tell whether a case is a political one or not by just reading the judgment. 
They use the most vacuous and weak words and phrases like copious, 大量 appeared 17 times in the 69 selected cases, and many times, 多次 appeared 10 times to describe the criminal facts of the defendant. Sometimes they choose to use something more trivial like constantly, 持续 or long-standing, 长期 This sort of wording even contradicts to their own sentencing regulations. The Supreme People's Court in Mainland China will issue and had indeed issued opinions on sentencing of various kinds of crimes. There were definitions laid out in those opinions of how to define large amount, 数量大 larger amount, 数量较大 huge amount, 数量巨大 and particularly large amount, 数量特别巨大 in different categories of crimes. However, there is nowhere to find the definitions of copious or many times. And by reading these selected judgments, we cannot help but wonder how copious is considered copious. In the case of Yao Yongsheng of Dalian of Liaoning, one original tweet and twenty-eight retweets were hilariously considered copious. He was sentenced to six months of imprisonment for his such provocative acts. In fact, his case was quite interesting. Also, say that for only one hundred and twenty-eight and twenty-eight retweets, the prosecution accused him of undermining the national image, endangering the national interests, and insulting the leader of the party and the state. The national image and national interests are apparently so fragile to the prosecutors, since only one tweet have the power to undermine them all. And the lack of motive in the judgments is so common that only five in the 69 selected cases of purely political reasons had made a statement on the motive of the defendant. Four of them resorting to venting emotions or venting personal spite, and one claimed the defendant committed the crime out of feeling his life situation is not satisfactory, which was exactly the case of Yao Yongsheng that we've just reviewing of. All of the rest of the judgment lack the description of motive, as if the crimes were just committed at will, as to lay out the extent and content of the infringed legal interests of the crime committed by the defendant in the judgment, since most of the selected cases were prosecuted with the crime of picking quarrels and provoking trouble. We should expect the judgment to give well-argued proof of how the public order was disturbed or disrupted in those cases, as it is the exact legal interest that was protected by this specific category of crime defined by Article 293 of the Criminal Law of Mainland China. But no, if we lower the standard for them to require the judgment to lay out the reactions we received. The clicks, views, replies, comments, reports, etc. After all, we were accused of disrupting the public order. How on earth that public order would be disrupted if no one was there to react to it? But the answer, however, in some of the cases, is still no. In fact, I've made a five-tier scale of the level of details of the selected judgments, with the following results returned. It is shocking to say that there should be 16 cases with 69 in total that have no details or data at all. The defendant should be sentenced to fixed imprisonment with the most vacuous accusations. Take the case of Xu Kun of Kunming of Yunnan, for example. The judgment waffled for four pages, and yet it still failed to tell what she posted on Twitter or how many tweets did he post. Nor can the judgment tell us what reactions he received. All of them were empty words and political slogans. The judgment went on reprimanding the defendant by claiming that he showed no repentance, which had revealed a certain degree of subjective malignancy and danger to the society. It shamelessly ended with, which I quote: "In the interest of maintaining the social order, purifying the social climate, and building a clean and virtuous online environment, blah blah blah," the court hereby rules that. Four pages of total nonsense, and yet they did not dare to let us know what she said that led him to two years of imprisonment. Same as the judgment received by Chiu Dianzheng of Tangshan of Hebei, he was charged in citing some version, and yet the judgment was finished in less than three pages with no details disclosed at all. The prosecution accused him of having posted something on Twitter that verified the leader of the party and the state, 
defame the state power and the socialist system. As for what exactly did he post it on Twitter, no one can gather from the judgment. I can give more examples of this, but that would be too verbose to tire you all. I've actually written a 60-page long review of this, which is why they are numbered here, but sadly I cannot share the document since there was something not appropriate to be disclosed in it. And I reckon that you can still gather the image of the arbitrary criminalization in these empty words. In fact, I extracted all the accusations of the 69 selected cases, sliced them into phrases, and removed the repeated ones. And here is the result. First, we can highlight the word leader, which in most of the cases denotes Xi Jinping himself. Nearly half of the accusations were about him. Second, we now light up the words related to CCP, the party, and other words like communism or socialism. More words were lit up, so when I say that they turned purely political, I really mean it. They were all about the leader, the party, and the ideology. And in this very corner, we can see the reappearance of reactionary, which is quite alarming to me, together with these anti-party, anti-socialism accusations, we are on the way to the revival of a narrative that resonates with the Cultural Revolution. The judgment that did give details, however, offered us a chance to get a glimpse of how low the bar now is to put one into prison for what they have said. In the case of a man with the surname of Xu of Dalian of Liaoning, he was sentenced to one whole year for five sentences as shown on the screen. He wanted to express his support for the Hong Kong protesters, which of course is not tolerated by the CCP regime. In the case of Jiang Yuchun of Songyuan of Jilin, he was sentenced to 14 months, even two months longer than that of Xu of Dalian. What he had once posted a one-line remark on WeChat was singled out as his evidence of guilt, in which he said, property prices are about to plunge, while the CCP mouthpieces rampantly chant, rampantly flaunting their power and force, only paved the way to perish as the madness has begun. And most abhorrently, the case of Zhang Wenfang of Sanhe of Hebei has shown us the extent of utter shamelessness that one should be criminalized for reading a poem to commemorate those who died of the draconian lockdown in Wuhan back in 2020. How shameless that they claim that what was written in verse was not true. It was true and it has always been true. Those ruthless lockdowns have repeatedly created so many tragedies that happened in any place where the lockdown is implemented, taking at least hundreds of people's lives at a time, even a grand city like Shanghai, and after two years since the outbreak, cannot avoid them. There was even a project online that collected information about those who died of the lockdown in Shanghai. And yet the lockdown tragedies never end. So to summarize, in these 69 selected purely political cases, we can see that firstly there is no geographical difference. Well, in a way, I mean, if you reckon that you can take refuge in some provinces or any other part of mainland China to escape political persecution, that is, of course, not possible. 24 of the 31 provinces effectively controlled by the CCP regime have reported speech crime cases in such a small sample. And if you take all the 291 criminal judgments of the cases that were collected by Speech Freedom of Satan since 2016 into an account, there are only two provincial divisions that have no speech crime cases reported, and the two are Gansu and Tibet. And by knowing that one should be Tibet and another was a province with a large number of Hui people, the Chinese-speaking Muslims, and considering that there was only one judgment of speech crime cases exposed from Xinjiang for all those years, we can easily assume that those two provincial divisions that without speech crime cases reported were just very good at hiding them. And secondly, the age of the grassroots dissidents varied. Unlike the petitioners that were nearly all in their middle-aged years, the grassroots dissidents have a more extended spectrum of age. Among them, the youngest was only 21 by capture, while the oldest was 72. 
Certainly, they are not as highly educated as we might think, although there is a huge improvement in the educational backgrounds of these purely political dissidents compared to the petitioners. The overall level of education received by the dissidents is not as high as we might think. We can see that over 56% of the defendants in the selected cases had not received higher education, 37% only finished compulsory education, with nearly 10% of them even dropped out as a compulsory education of stage. And number four, suffering from mental illnesses, disability or poverty, cannot exempt you from being imprisoned if you dare to insult the state leader. We've already seen the cases of Zhang Shuding, Zhou Xiaoqing and Di Fei, all of whom were suffering from mental illnesses, and yet they were still sentenced to imprisonment for insulting the state leader. And here is a case of another unfortunate guy. His name is Liu Hai of Hulu Liaoning. He claimed that his disability allowance was deprived for unknown reasons, and at the same time, he had heard that the National Purchase Prize for Maize has been lowered due to the will of the state leader. He then posted abusive remarks on the state leader in the QQ group on the 17th of June 2019. A one-time commit from such a guy who was already in misery cannot exempt him from being imprisoned for six months. And here are the lengths of sentences and the lengths or assumed lengths of the defendants being detained in detention centers or put under RSDL. The lengths of sentences of purely political cases varied from 6 months to 15 months in the selected cases. Nearly 70% of the defendants that reached the court ruling between 2019 and early 2021 received sentences of fixed-term imprisonment for one year or less. But there were some cases that received extremely long sentences. And this is the case of Wang Wei of Wulan Card of Inner Mongolia. Being captured at the age of 26, he was accused and convicted of using the court to undermine the implementation of the law for his two essays posted on websites outside mainland China that expressed his solidarity with the Hong Kong protesters, which were of course not tolerated by the regime and he was sentenced to four whole years in prison for that. It is very likely that he is still stranded in prison by the time this video is published. More unfortunately, Liu Zhenhua of Zhoukou of Henan was sentenced to 15 months of imprisonment. That is even two months longer than one way of Ulan Card of Inner Mongolia for only one essay that he posted on an online forum named Kidnet BBS. Fortunately, for most of the grassroots dissidents, the sentences were not very long, even though it has shown the trend to be longer these days. And sadly, newer data after the late 2020 to early 2021 cannot be retrieved since they choose to remove all the political cases from the online database. According to Article 264 of the Criminal Procedure Law 2018, if the rest of the sentence of a convicted is shorter than three months by the time of the transferring, the convicted will serve the rest of the term in detention centers and not be transferred to prison. In reality, however, the situations were a little bit complicated, and I've explained this in detail in a former video, and the link to that is in the description. But to make a long story short, as we can gather from this chart on the screen, there is indeed an improvement in the trend of the time of being detained in detention centers, which is good since the conditions in detention centers are far worse than those of prisons. Now, let's get on to some speculations of this critical question. How many? That is, how many speed crime cases are in a year? Well, we of course cannot get the precise number since the CCP regime chose to hide all the data but we can do some speculations. As I mentioned earlier in this video, back in early 2021, there was a time when the judgment of political cases were just hidden, they were unsearchable, and the contents will not be shown if clicked, but the citation could be browsed if filters were carefully selected, like this one shown on the screen. In the middle of May 2021, just days before they were all taken down, I learned about this trick and tried it with an eastern coastal city, Dali. 
I managed to keep a record of the citations of the judgments of some hidden picking quarrels and provoking trouble cases there, but it was too late that day and I decided to come back later to get on with it with a well-formed collection sheet to see if I can discover something. But my procrastination had failed me in this. By the time I returned to this, the website had already removed all of them, not even the citations could be recorded by then. So I have only recorded 12 citations of hidden picking quarrels and provoking trouble cases that happened in Tallinn over the period of about one year, that is from about July 2020 to April 2021. So that's 12 in total, but there was one other case that is not listed above, and that is because its content was somehow not hidden but published, even though it was purely a political one, and it was the exact case of the man Xu named Xu, who posted five remarks in support of Hong Kong protesters. So there's a total of at least 13 known speech crime cases in less than one year, in a place that took up only 0.528% of the whole population. If we accept this statistic and scale it up equivalently to the nationwide, it would be 2,463 convicted picking quarrels and provoking trouble cases that are exclusively linked to political reasons. But these hidden judgments of picking quarrels and provoking trouble are only a part of all the categories that may contribute to or are dedicated to speech crimes. The largest portion, though may be, they are still inciting subversion of the state power, disturbing public order in the gang, disturbing state organs in the gang, disturbing the work order of state organs, obstructing public services, etc. And cases in these categories would have a high chance of not being recorded with the citations on that website in the first place. So this number of 2,463 is definitely a conservative estimation of speech crimes that happened in mainland China in a year, or in the year of 2020. But if we want to take our speculations further, we will have to pause here for the moment to understand the Citation Convention of Judgment of Court in mainland China, like this one shown on the screen. Since 2016, the courts in mainland China have adopted a new convention in the citations of judgment. The citation begins with a year in which the case files with the court by the prosecution. It is worth noticing that it is the year that the case was registered at the court, not necessarily the year the court tries it or it reaches a court ruling. After that, it will come to the abbreviation of the provincial division where the court is located. The abbreviations of the provincial divisions are the historical convention that sometimes will not just be the first character of the name of the division, which is listed here on the screen. And after the abbreviation of provincial divisions, there comes the code of the local level division where the court is located. It adheres to the administrative division codes of mainland China. To this one, for example, the citation begins with Lu, which means Shandong province, and it is followed by the code 1321. We can then get that it is this judgment that was decided by the court in Yinan County of Linyi of Shandong. For the foreign code only counting the first two digits, 13, we then can know that this is a judgment ruled by the Linyi Intermediate People's Court. Following that, the word Xing means that it is a criminal case, and Chu means the first instance, and Zhong means the second and the final instance. It does not necessarily mean that it is indeed the final trial, which I have explained in a formal video I made with a link to it in the description. And the last part of the citation is the numbering of the case that the prosecution filed with the court in the same calendar year. A last example is that when no digits are following the provincial abbreviation, like here shown on the screen, there are no digits following Lu, then it means the judgment is made by the High Court, and here in this example will be the Shandong High Court. Here is the judgment of Liu Zhixiong of the Lianshui of Jiangsu. The citation reads 2019 Su 0826-Xing-Chu number 385. And the judgment told us that the prosecution filed the case with this court on the 15th of October 2019. 
Here is another judgment of Qin Xingdi and Liu Yaojun of Aksu City, a county-level city of Xinjiang, with numbering in the citation skyrocketing to 3043, and the case was registered on the 12th of December 2019. Now, 15th of October 2019 was the 195th working day of that year, and the 12th of December was the 237th. That year of 2019 had 250 working days in total. The county level city of Aksu has a population of only 551,000 to 695,000, according to various sources, while Lianxue County has a population of 1,112,900 to 1,154,000, also according to different sources. If we can assume that the registration rate of cases were fairly uniform throughout the year, then it would mean that the county-level city of Aksu had a rate of 5,152 criminal cases per million people, while the rate of criminal cases in the entry of Jiangsu was only 435 cases per million people. It's not wrong, trust me, I double-checked my formula in Excel. So first, we can easily get that the rating Aksu was almost 10 to 13 times higher than it in the entry of Jiangsu, and by combining the statistic we got in Dalian with the calculation we've made here with the entry, if we assume that the eastern areas shared a similar crime rate, then if this is done for all criminal cases in a year in an average eastern city, this small portion here will be those political cases. But since the criminal rate in the county of Xinjiang is almost 10 to 13 times higher than an eastern county, then if we can assume that this is a common phenomenon, we then can roughly get this bar to represent all the criminal cases in a year in a place in Xinjiang like Aksu. We can equivalently apply the political case ratio to this bar, but that will leave us this large portion of excessive cases unexplainable, unless we accept an improbable scenario that the people in some small county like Aksu in Xinjiang are extremely criminal-minded, and therefore the amount of theft, robbery, etc. can be as high as 10 times more than that of its eastern counterparts. If not, then the only reasonable explanation left for us is that these are all political persecutions, or at least a large amount of these are. So when we look back at this estimation we made based on the eastern coastal city Darlene, I reckon we can say with confidence that this estimation is indeed a quite conservative one. The real number, I'm afraid, we'll never know. And that was only in 2020. The current situation can only get far worse than that. But sadly, we cannot get any data on it anymore.